Well, I learned how to fence, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. Uh, it was before my 10th birthday, I was visiting my favorite uncle, or at the time I thought he was my uncle, but he was really my cousin. Uh, well, my uh, uncle was there, who was really my grandfather. Now, that doesn't make sense to many people, but uh, the thing is that uh, I was born out of wedlock, and my mother was 17 years old. So her aunt took me and raised me, so therefore the people I thought were my cousins were really my aunts, uncles, and the ones I thought were my uncles was really my grandfather. So to get back to your question, how did I learn to fence? Well, just before my 10th birthday, while well, being over at their house, <coughs> my uncle grandfather said to me, uh, you're almost 10 years old, yeah? He says, it's time that uh, this is the age you must learn to become a man. He says, you will come into the backyard with me, and I will teach you the secret of manhood. Come. So we went into the backyard where he handed me a pipe about so long, and it was filled with concrete. I didn't understand that. And he said to me, uh, you will hold this pipe out at arm's length until I say it's all right to put it down. Yeah? You will answer me, please? I said, uh, yes, Uncle Max. Okay, he says, I go into our house now, so you hold that. I'll be back in just a short while. He disappeared into the house, and I was holding this pipe out there. And soon the pipe weighed something like three and a half, four pounds. And I just kept holding it and holding it. And finally, my arm started to waver. I was getting a bit tired. And the voice came out, I see what you're doing. Hold that out straight. Well, it, back out it went for God knows how long until he finally came out and took it away from me. And he said, is that this all for today? He says, uh, come back tomorrow and uh, we talk some more. And that was my first lesson on learning how to fence. The second day I came back, he did the same thing to me. We did this for three days. And then he said to me, you don't come back tomorrow, you come back the day after, yeah? Okay. You have to understand that uh, my <clears throat> uncle grandfather was the head of surgery at uh, Heidelberg University, and he came to this country in 1902. And he had fought many duels in Germany, and he had the scars to show it. So he decided this is how you should learn to become a man. So the next day I came back, he uh, handed me a German cavalry saber, which was much lighter than the pipe with the concrete in it. And he said to me, now this begins, we teach you how the art of sword play. And this is not fencing. He says, Jack, this is dueling. There is a difference. There are rules to fencing. There are not too many rules to dueling. However, he started with teaching me this and that and this position and that position and court and sixth and all, all the terms. And then one day he said, now we fence. So he took up the sword and we fenced, whereupon he slashed my, what was it, yeah, my left arm and I had a three-inch gash in that arm, and uh, I started to whimper, and he says, there will be no tears. He says, man, don't cry. He says, you will come with me? So he took the sword, and we went into the house, and he says, Peppy, that was his wife, who was really my grandmother, but I thought she was my aunt. <laughs> well, you'll catch on after a while. <laughs> and he said, bring to me the sewing kit. So she brought him the sewing kit, and he threaded a needle. He lit a match, and he burned the needle. And he looked at me, and he said, And now there will be no tears. Yeah? You understand? No tears. And he stuck the needle through, and he started sewing up the wound. And after he closed it off and tied a knot and bandaged it, he says, And now you will go home, but you will not tell... The mother, what happened? Yeah, he says, she would think you fell down and cut it. When you came to me, 
and I bandaged it for you. You understand that? I said, yes, Uncle Max, I understand that. And that was it. I went home. My mother said, what happened? I said, I fell down. She unwrapped it, looked at it, and she said, I will talk to your Uncle Max tomorrow. That is the beginning of how I learned the art of swordplay. And believe me, <laughs> it was a very, very difficult, difficult time. Two years of that was enough to drive anybody crazy. Oh, yes. He said one of his little tricks to torment me. <clears throat> you know, the old window shades, they had a pull string on it and a little ring at the bottom of it. You could put your finger through and pull it down. He handed me this sword and he stood me back. He says, now, he says, you will trust as if and put the sword through the hole. Okay. So I thrusted. Nothing happened. I thrust it again. You see what he had done is he pulled the shade down and let it go. So the shade shot up. And every time I thrust it, I missed it. And this went on and on and on. This went on for two days like that. And finally, a thought occurred to me. I said, you know, Uncle Max, I think I'm smarter than you are. And I'm 10 years old. I know what I'm going to do. So he pulled the shade down. And he says, Art now, are you ready? I said, yes. And I aimed three inches above the little ring, and the blade went right through the center. And he said, oh, that's so very lucky. And he pulled it down again. He says, and now I will count to three, and then I will let it go. He said, one, two, and he let it go, and I aimed far above it and went through the center. And I handed him the sword and said, Uncle Max, it's your turn. He giggled and said, I will see you tomorrow. And that's the end of my sword story. Okay, Jack, I understand you were a very adventurous little boy. Can you tell us some of the things that you did when you were a little boy with that uh, famous New York game called Ring Olivio? Oh, yeah, it's a favorite game. Ring Olivio is a game of, oh, can we, can we have sides. You can have three on a side, four on a side, ten on a team, it doesn't matter. And the object is one team is it. They get to run away, and the other team runs to catch them and brings them back to an area called the den. Now, once you get three people in that den, the game is over, and the ones who capture them wins. So we give them 10-second head start, and they take off, and we take off after them. Uh, these people were fairly slow, and uh, we were fairly quicker than they were. And we were running up, gathering up these people, and this one Arnie Needleman ran into uh, an apartment building, grabbed the elevator just as I came into the building. The elevator door closed. I couldn't get onto the elevator. So I headed for the staircase. As I got to the second floor, the elevator started up for the third and the fourth and the fifth, and I was running the stairs all the way. I was going to capture him or die trying. <laughs> I almost did. So anyway, it got to the sixth floor of the apartment building. Now, the apartment buildings in New York at that time in this particular area, they started out close together in front. But then to the back, they spread this way, where the women used to hang their clotheslines from the sixth floor down to the first floor. So he got in this elevator, and he's up at the sixth floor, and he runs up the staircase to the roof, and I follow him up. And he's running down one side, and I'm on the other. And he crosses over, and I cross over, and I'm following him back and forth. And now he's running on another side, and I think, oh, he's headed to the uh, building on the other side. And he's going to take the elevator stairs down, and he's going to get away from me. So I was on this side, and he just stepped over the little embankment that they have and was on the next roof. I took off and did a little jump, and when I looked up, I realized the other building was 30 feet away, and I was on the way down from six floors up. Now, <laughs> you don't realize it, but all of a sudden, if you remember the cartoons back then, they had these things where the rabbit or whoever the, the 
object was, it stood in midair for a split second. That's what it seemed like. Well, the first rope, the first clothesline, caught me between the legs and flipped me backwards and hit me on the back of the neck. The second threw me forward and caught me over here, and they were snapping on the way down. Now, each floor from six floors down, thank God for all those different clotheslines, because I hit the ground, got up, and ran home. I went into the house, went into the bed, and uh, then there was, uh, oh, about an hour later, a knock at the door. And it was the local constabulary, and who knew my mother fairly well by this time. And uh, she answered the door, and he said, Mrs. B, uh, is uh, Jackie at home? He says, uh, yeah, he came in a little while ago, about an hour ago. I think, uh, I think he's in his room. He said, oh, he says, well, you know where his room is. You've been there before. <laughs> so he walked over, opened the door, jumped in, and pulled the covers off me. Oh, all right. You hurt yourself? I said, huh? Well, what are you talking about? Are you hurt? I said, I said I, Solomon, I, I don't know what you mean. Uh, why would I be hurt? He says, well, he says, uh, Mrs. Gottlieb from 26B stuck her hat out the window of her apartment, and she saw this body hurtling through space. And then she saw the body get up and run away. She says, now I know of only one person who could do something like that and get away with it and actually live through it. And he grabbed my leg and he twisted this and he says, no pain. I said, no, no, I don't know what you're talking about, but not me. He says, uh-huh. He says, oh, well, goodbye. And he left. But those guys couldn't keep their mouths shut. They snitched on me and I got in trouble again. And that was just one little item of my life. Oh, okay, that's very simple. Uh, we, the Boy Scouts of America, I was a den leader. And coming home from a meeting from a bright, we held our meetings on the boardwalk at the Bright Hatton Civic Club in Brighton Beach. And we were walking down Brighton 6th Street and with the apartment buildings. And the buildings had uh, oh, one line of bricks in, one line out, in, out, in, out, you know, like a stepladder. And one of the washermen twins said to me, uh, I bet you wouldn't climb that up. And I said, why would I want to climb that? He said, give you a dollar, I bet you a dollar you wouldn't climb that. For a dollar? You sure? Okay, for a dollar. Okay, take my hat. I handed him my hat, and I started up the side of the building. And I was about... Uh, uh, summer had just begun, so it was fairly light when I started. It was probably close to about 8 o'clock, and I was still climbing and climbing. Now I got up to the sixth floor, which was with the roof, and I reached to get up to the roof, and I couldn't get up to the roof because it curved over this way, and I couldn't reach over to the other side. The only thing I could do was go sideways or go straight down. Now my fingertips were getting tired, very tired. My toes were aching <laughs> from hanging on so long. So I noticed there was a window open to the side, maybe eight feet away. So I slowly, very, very slowly inched myself over a little at a time. And I finally got to this window, which was open, thank goodness. And I reached in with my right hand like this, took a deep breath and prayed that this gymnastic move would work. So I pulled with this hand and pushed with the other. My body swung around and shot through the window into this room where a voice yelled out, Who is that? What is that? And I stood up and the voice said, Jack, is that you? I said, How do I get out of here? How do I get out of here? She pointed. This was some girl named Joni, her it was her bedroom. <laughs> I got into the hallway and headed for the door, got out the door, just as her father got in there and opened the door to the hall, and I was already around the corner. And I got home, and there was that usual, Mrs. B. Oh, not again. What now? Same routine. 
Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Uh, we heard that uh, you climbed up the side of a building and couldn't get down. Of course I could get down. I'm here. She says, and how did you get down? I said, Mr. Solomon, between you and me, I don't know. I'm just down. So, did yeah. you had another incident uh, where you got into a little trouble for doing something on gymnastics on the... Oh, well, yeah, it's the state of New Jersey and the state of New York couldn't decide which one had the, the rights to me. Uh, I was going and walking across the George Washington Bridge with a few friends who were going camping, and we camped on the Jersey side. Those, those were the wilds, you know, really, really. If you wanted adventure, you went into New Jersey. Wow. So I stripped off the pack one day, and I did a handstand on the railing of the bridge, just as police car pulled up in the, the, the NYPD, and uh, <laughs> they stopped me and pulled me off and said, gave me a lecture on how dangerous that was. And then here came a car from the other side. It was the state of, it was the state of New Jersey, whoever the police department they were, I don't know, city, state. They couldn't decide who had jurisdiction. Oh, NYPD won, and they took me in to, I mean, they called my mother, and I was in jail for four hours until my mother came and got me and had a promise I'd never do that again. But I was known to break promises. <laughs> but never, never, on the Jer never on the Jersey side. More questions. Okay, uh, Jack, uh, tell us how you got into the movies. Uh, I was <clears throat> discharged from the Navy out of San Diego. <clears throat> and I uh, went to visit a cousin of mine who lived... Uh, near Fair, on Fairfax in Hollywood. And we, I was there for two days and we were talking and just resting and doing nothing. And uh, he said, uh, you know, this, I heard there's a notice that uh, Warner Brothers is looking for guys who could fence, who were athletic. You know, you were a gymnast and you played football and you were not of all sorts and uh, you were good with the sword. So they were looking for uh, people for a Errol Flynn movie. He said, oh, no, nah, I don't want to be in show business anymore. I've had it with my parents. And they said, well, they're paying so much and so much a day. I said, what? Okay, drop me off. He drove me over to Warner Brothers, dropped me off at the gate. I walked up to the gate, and the guy looked at me and says, hi, how you doing? Uh, they're waiting for you at stage six. Okay. Like, I, like he knew me all my life. I guess it's if you look like you belong, you belong. I went in there, and there was this room, and uh, there were about 40 guys in this long, narrow room. And uh, the door in the corner opened up, and a little guy walked in, and uh, in walked my hero, Errol Flynn, all six foot two inches of him. And he looked around, and uh, he said to the little man, he says, yeah, he says, they'll do. Uh, and he says, by the way, anybody here over six feet tall? So nobody, no, 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 and I was in the corner. I said, how about five, ten and a half? And he looked at me and he says, no. He says, that's all right. I said, okay, thank you. He said, oh, by the way, uh, would you shave that mustache? I said, for you, Mr. Flynn, anything. He chuckled and left the room. And just as he was going out the door, he turned to this little man. He says, put this guy behind me on two. I didn't know what he meant by that. But uh, the scene was supposed to be where uh, we were entering the castle or the palace to save the king and the queen from this dastardly fate. And uh, he was fighting two, and I was fighting two, and everybody else was one on one. Now, toward the end of this fight scene that we had, uh, Mr. Flynn was getting a little bit up in age, so he didn't do the dive off the steps. They called in Jock Mahoney to do that. So when they said cut, and stuntman came and he threw the sword he was going away because he had just said the line was, uh, the sword is not for traitors, you die by the knife. So he threw the sword away. At the end of the shot, the director says, cut, print, that's it, it's a wrap. Everybody go home. He went and picked up the sword and he was breathing rather heavy and says, hey, sport. And I turned around and said, 
put, and he said, yeah, you, you, here, souvenir, and he threw it to me. I caught it. I have that sword to this very day. It's my favorite sword. I've got many from different, different movies, but that one I prize. And uh, as I walked away again, he said, uh, hey, sport, come here. He says, uh, we're having a little get-together with the stuntmen up at my house. Uh, why don't you come up with them? I said, well, Mr. Flynn, uh, I don't know my way around. I'm heading back to New York. I was discharged from the Navy. And he says, well, you can come up. He called one of the stuntmen over and said, uh, hey, bring him up when you come up. Yeah, okay, Baron. And he says, by the way, you can call me Baron. I didn't know what Baron meant. Later on, I found out he was often referred to as the Baron of Mulholland. So I went up there and... Uh, he got me into the movie business, but not as an actor. I didn't want to do that. So uh, he uh, had many conversations. He asked me if I could ride a horse. I said, yes, I can ride a horse. He didn't believe that because he said, you're from New York. How do you ride a horse? I said, well, I had a girlfriend who was a doctor. Her father had two horses, and I had free reign. I could use them whenever I wanted to just to exercise them. They were held down at a place called Garrison Beach. And I'd go down there, saddle up this horse named Sire, and he kicked the heck out of me. He was a nasty brute, but I had learned several different things. I said, just be as nasty to him as he is to you, and he'll come around. So I got a clothesline and practice lassoing and lariats, all of it I have got thrown. I learned to fall off. So many different things. I learned to, my, uh, to mount on the move, to flip onto the saddle, get dragged along, and everything you could possibly do in a saddle I tried. And that's how I learned to ride. And he says, well, it just so happens that your neighbor down there has a couple of horses. He brought one up here. He's babysitting. I'm babysitting. He's going away. Why don't you throw a saddle on it and show me what you can do? So I went and got the horse, let him out, put the threw the blanket on him, put the saddle on, cinched it up, started to lead the horse away. And he said, uh, where are you going? I said, Baron, I'll be right back. I dropped the reins, the horse stopped. I kept walking, turned around, ran for the horse, dove into the air, flipped around into the saddle. The horse pulled back on the reins, the horse different, and took off around the property and dodging in and out of all these trees that he had up there. And then I reined the horse in back and up, and the horse slid to a stop right in front of him. And he looked at me and he said, uh, I said nice, nice, is that all you've got? I said, mm, I got a little bit more. He says, show me. So I galloped around again, and instead of reining in the horse, this time when I went, didn't go underneath the branch, I caught the branch, came up, came around, climbed up onto the branch, walked down onto it, looked at him and said, welcome to Sherwood. He immediately dropped a bottle of scotch in the glass and laughed hysterically. And he said, I knew it, I knew it. And he said to me, if you decide you want to be in this business, he said, just come and knock at my door. He said, no matter how long it takes, if I'm not here, wait for me. So I went back to New York. I couldn't get a job at the airlines. I couldn't get a job playing football. In pro football, I was much too light. So I decided, well, I'll go back and see if Mr. Flynn is true to his word. So I went up and got to Mulholland. At the time, I had $11.19 left in my pocket. <laughs> I knocked at the door, and the houseboy answered it, and he says, oh, Mr. Jack. I remembered me. So he says, you come in, you come in. He said, Mr. Finn, not a here, but he said, you wait for him. He come back. You wait. You wait. He said, you stay in this bedroom. He said, you're not going in Mr. Finn's bedroom. You stay out of his bedroom. Okay. But <laughs> stay out? Me? Stay? No, 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 no. When it says, do not enter, I enter. I looked in there. I was not surprised. I found mirrors on the ceilings, on the walls. It's nice, very nice. It's not my kind of a room. So uh, I made myself comfortable in the old bedroom, and the next uh, morning I got up, went in there, went into the kitchen, made myself some breakfast. The houseboy said good morning, and he minded his own business. And uh, 
there was a knock at the door, and then the doorbell rang, and I got up to answer it. As I headed for the door, I was almost there when the houseboy cut in front of me opened the door, and there were two very lovely ladies standing there. And uh, <laughs> they said to him, wait, is uh, Mr. Flynn at home? He said, oh, no, Mr. Flynn, uh, he not home. But uh, his son, he home. And there began my education in Hollywood. So, Jack, a few years ago you were taking some relatives to uh, through Southern, Southern California, and, and we passed through Solvang, and um, we're up at Lake Petuma at a Vista Point. Can you tell us about that? Andrew? Oh, yeah, well, uh, my wife had some relatives uh, visiting from uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, she was, the wife was from uh, Massachusetts, as my wife was, but he was from Bulgaria and spent a lot of time in Israel. And the only thing you wanted to know about anything was, how much this cost? What cost this? This is a lot of money, this? How much is this? Where is the castle that is lived in by, by, by King Regan? Where, where is that? I said, he didn't live in a castle. He had a little home. On him. So I said, it's up there, a very narrow dirt road. He lives in about 800 square feet of house. He's, uh, the uh, Secret Service has better lodgings than he had. He said, no, the New York Times says he lives in Big Palace. I said, don't believe everything you read in the New York Times about Reagan. So anyway, uh, we're up at the top of the hill, and this man walks up to me. And, oh, he says to me, uh, he says, that's a very big lake. And I said, yeah, it's a man-made lake. He says, man makes this lake? I said, no, it's man-made. He says, yeah, you said, man makes this lake. Not one man, no. A bunch of men made the lake. It's made by men. Oh, I say, well, I understand now. So anyway, uh, some gentleman there overheard this conversation, and he says, are you a tour guide? And I said, no, these people are from out of town. We're just showing them around. And he says, uh, you from you from Santa Barbara here? I said, no, no. He said, oh. uh, huh. It's just I thought I recognized something about you. So uh, said, no, I'm not from here at all. He said, oh. Uh, he said, uh, can I ask you? Uh, where are you from? I said, Fresno. He says, oh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry again. He says, no, I can't let this go. He says, were you always from Fresno? I said, no, I lived in uh, Hollywood. He says, oh. I said, no, I, I lived in uh, San Fernando Valley. He says, really, where? And I told him the address and the street, and he says, I live two blocks from there. I know exactly what the building you're talking about. Those were a string of condos. I said, yeah, I had an, owned a condo there. He says, oh, and he says, uh-huh. He says, well, maybe uh, I ran into you in the market. And I said, well, I've never been in that market. Oh. But it's just this, this feeling, oh, well. And he goes to walk away again. He says, I'm sorry. He says, one more question. He says, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm retired. He says, well, what did you do? I said, well, I uh, ran a, a company that uh, supplied equipment to law enforcement. Oh, he said, well, I guess I struck out completely. And he just wouldn't let up. He, came, he said, one more question, please. I said, go, go, you might as well keep on. He said, did you always do that? I said, no, not always. I said, he said, what else did you? I said, well, I was involved in the movie business for a while. He says, ah, we're getting there. Okay, I see it, just a minute. He says, he said, what did you do? I said, where did you work? I said, well, I started out at uh, doing stunt work at uh, Monogram. Then I went over to Universal because they wanted to hire me as an actor. But this thing worked out. As things worked out, uh, the movie business was dying because of television. So they let a lot of people go. And I was one of the few that they were going to let go one of the seven that they were going to let go. So I figured I'd say goodbye, and I climbed up the side of the building on the ladders that go over the soundstage, and I did a handstand at the top, 
And I came down, and this man grabbed me and said, we didn't know you did that. I said, we know you were good with a sword, but uh, we didn't know you did that sort of thing. I said, well, what do you know about my being good with the sword? Anyway, he says, well, I was in 1947, I was at uh, Universal Studios, but I'm not as old as you are. I'm 10 years younger than you, but my father was a cameraman. And every chance I got when I was out in school, I was with him learning the, the ropes because everything back then went from father to son, father to son. So uh, he continues telling me this, and he says, uh, I used to like to go to the gym and watch these guys work out. He says, and there was one guy there who was fairly you know, muscular more than the rest. He says, but I really got a kick out of going to watching, watching the guys in the fencing class. You see, they had this room set up that uh, looked like uh, a French tavern. And they'd do their fencing there, and they'd do their little things here, and he was instructing them. He called up Tony Curtis and says, now you, and then he called up Rock Hudson, and, says, and they had Robert Wagner was there at the time, and, and uh, Hugh O'Brien was there. And then he says, points to me, he says, you're new. He says, why don't you step up here and, uh, and we'll see if you have any form or what you can do with a sword. He says, go select one. So I went up and I selected a rapier, which is like an epe, but it was a rapier. It's a movie rapier. And he said, oh, you're starting at the top. He says, all right. He says, now step out onto the mat. And so we step out over here. you got tables and chairs and you got a balcony and all sorts of stuff in there. <laughs> so I'm holding the sword like this. He says, no, 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 no. Let, let me show you here. We do this, and my fingers go through here like that. He says, now, when I come like that, you do this. And I, okay. So he lunges at me. Not lunges, he thrusts at me, and I slam it down like this, and I back away. And he says, no, don't run away from it. Just, just use the blade to, to parry it, to block it. Okay. He comes at me again, and I go the other way like this, and I shudder. And he says, no, let's, all right, let's do this very slowly. Like this. Like all right, good. Now there it is. Yeah. He says, now, one, two, three, four. That's it. One, two, three, four. Very good. And he's, now he's speeding it up. And then I did a reverse on him and flipped it, and his blade went flying. He came down, I handed it to him, I said, oops, and he looked at me. He says, all right, he says, I'm through playing around with you now, Let, let's be serious about this. And how he's coming at me and he's got vengeance in his eye. So now we have a dueling match. We stepped right into it and he's coming, he's fetching <laughs> back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And here we go again. He's on that side of the table. I'm on this side of the table. He lunges at me again. I take the sword out of his hand again. I threw mine up in the air, and I dove over the table, flipped, caught it, came up with the blade at his throat, and I said, touche. And I opened my hands. I dropped the blade, and I headed for the door and walked out. That was the last I saw of him. Meanwhile, as I got to the door, everybody went, way to go, D'Artagnan, way to go. That's on the license plate of my car today, D'Artagnan.